Welcome back to the channel guys. Now for many of you, like myself, this scene right here is a scene you're very, very, very familiar with. This right here was many hours as a child and uh, ate up a lot of time and interest in my childhood. In addition to having an NES, I also had a computer that we had for the family uh, that ran DOS. And if you guys have followed me for quite some time, you'll know that I played some DOS games uh, and that they kind of shaped me as a gamer today and I didn't get back into console gaming until I got to the Nintendo 64. So I kind of started going down on a journey here that kind of brought a lot of interest into uh, some things that, that kind of linked my two past items together, that being console games and PC games. So I want to take you guys on a short little journey that's going to propose a question uh, that will lead into another video. So go ahead and strap on in and let's take a look at something which is kind of like a rabbit hole, but I hope you guys enjoy it. Now well, here in the US, we absolutely love the Nintendo Entertainment System or the NES. Meanwhile in Japan, and actually before the Nintendo Entertainment System hit the streets in the US, Japan got the family computer. This goofy looking little thing over here. A major big difference between the two systems altogether, uh, and a name change nonetheless. Uh, we look at it and we see the Nintendo Entertainment System is a video games console. But then they come over and say, family computer. What does that actually really mean? Now, I didn't find out about really the family computer until much later. I was diving deep into uh, the small library of NES games that I had, as well as diving into my PC stuff. But uh, later on, I learned about the Famicom, or the family computer, and thought it was kind of neat, but never quite understood why they called it the family computer. You know, uh, if you've ever been to Japan, you've been to Family Mart, and they sell Fami Chicken, is Famicom just like family chicken uh, probably not but still um, it brought me down a, a list to try to figure out what was the whole point behind calling it the family computer was this really a computer to them uh, to me it didn't look like it. it was a game system it came with cartridges just like we had you had a cartridge and then you flip this little thing on the top here and you pop that cartridge in and boom you had games Didn't want games you eject it and you put a new game in. Close your little dust lid. Don't forget about your dust lid. Uh, it had these strange controllers on it. Uh, these controllers were they're attached to the system. Uh, by stark contrast, they're quite different. So, made you wonder why would they call something like that the family computer? And so I decided to do some digging and it brought me down a rabbit hole, of course. And that rabbit hole is what I'm here today to show you. So uh, let's go ahead and continue further down this rabbit hole. Now your first indication with the family computer that might indicate that this is just not your typical games console comes from a few select games, which I'm gonna share with you guys right now. These games here each have something in common. In the U.S., these games here were black box titles. Uh, I'm not so sure about this one, but this one here is, an, is of significance as well. We'll put this guy over here. Uh, so, these games all had something including this one here and this one here. Uh, this one not so much, but uh, we'll leave him off to the side to discuss for a little bit later. But highlight here these four games. These four games here are actually four games that uh, we had as black box titles. That's Excite Bike, Wrecking Crew, Mock Rider, and Load Runner. And most importantly, if you actually look at the label of the black label, they'll let you know that it's a game that you can design or you can create levels on. And this is then again supported by the manual. If you look in the manual for here for Mock Rider, it will tell you that it's got a design feature. And then the manual goes a little bit further into detail, obviously not in English, on how to do your level designs. So those three were ones that you probably uh, had some curiosity on. 
uh, as a kid, seeing that there was a design feature and you could never save that design. And we'll get a little bit deeper into that a little bit later, but most notably, the one that really set us off, the one that really tipped us off that there was more going on with the family computer has to be these three games here. Most notably, Super Mario USA, which here in the US is known as Super Mario Brothers 2. The Doki Doki Panic game, as well as Super Mario Brothers 2, or as we know it here in the US, Super Mario Brothers The Lost Levels. So why are these games more significant than the others? Well, because the story that goes along with this, as you guys have probably heard, uh, if you want to find out more about this, I'll link a, a channel below uh, called GTV Japan, where he goes into a lot of stuff about, not necessarily the technicality, but the, the history behind the whole Doki Doki Panic game. And then I'm sure there's other channels out there where you can find, uh, you know, why character sprite swaps. But that really brought us into these two pieces of media here. As you notice, these are Famicom games. But they're not the typical Famicom game that you would find normally. These Famicom games are made for disc. Which led us into the next thing to kind of traverse on our trek back to see that, hey, wait a minute, this might not be just your typical games console. And that, my friends, was this. The Famicom Disk System. Now, the Famicom Disk System comprised itself of a couple different components. The first component was the actual disk drive itself. As you can see, it's uh, quite sizable comparatively to the Famicom. Uh, it could be plugged in via a AC adapter, and this is the RAM extension portion of it, or you could put, I think, the D cell batteries in it to make it run. Apparently, D cells last quite some time on these things. And the other component to it was the actual RAM adapter itself. This part here, plugged into the top of our Famicom. and added extra RAM for our Famicom. Then, novelly enough, you just pick up your Famicom, slide your Famicom disk system in, plug her in the back, like so. Set your Famicom on top of the FDS, and now you have a full Famicom disk system set up. So, the Famicom disk system, uh, as you guys know, was disk operation. So the disk operation portion of it was simple enough. You take your disk, take it out of its protective sleeve, you would slide it into the disk drive. As I had the disk in there. Oh, well. And then you would turn your console on, just like any other day, and then the drive would read. Uh, you would read the disc and then you would be able to play just like any other game. Now, for purpose, there were a couple different kinds of ways that you could get discs. You could get ones like this, which was a kiosk written disc. Kiosk written meaning that it uh, had little kiosks that you could go get your discs written to, and you could go buy new games for cheap with discs, or you can get things like the, my copy of Doki Doki Panic here, which is actually a retail release or it came in a different looking container as well as came with a manual now those are important because those had the ability to read and write so you might be thinking to yourself well you know this system, read and write, cartridges, couldn't have saved batteries back in the day. Uh, so uh, the FDS was just something that came along a little bit later and solved all the problems from all these other games. And you may be right, but I figured that the rabbit hole needed to go a little bit deeper. So by now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute, I know for a fact 
that if you know anything about import games, you'll know that Excite Bike came out in 1984. And the Famicom Disk System didn't come out until two years later. So why would they put in something to program levels and Excite Bike and Load Runner and all those if with the game system that we were going to be able to use to be able to write stuff on uh, didn't come till two years later and even then you couldn't write from the cartridge to the disk system what's up with that in order to go ahead and write to them you would have had to have something else you would have had to have a copy of the game for that system like versus excite bike to be able to get the the level editor to work well and that's kind of where we continued down our journey. And that journey led me into something that started to make more sense as to why Nintendo called this the family computer. So while we were enjoying again our NES here in the States, prior to that, they had a mission. And that mission was to teach people how to program in BASIC. And as the European folks may know, the bedroom coder was king back in the early to mid 80s well just in the 80s in general and nintendo was no different than its competitors about trying to encourage the bedroom coder and that meant that they had to introduce something for the bedroom coder to be happy and that is family basic now Family Basic consisted of a couple of different things here directly for the Famicom, knowing that uh, the disk system was not around. We can go ahead and dismiss Mr. Disk System, and we can go ahead and put in our copy of Family Basic. For anybody who knows about that early uh, age of computing, RAM was really, really important, and RAM uh, was necessary for writing programs and storing programs. And basically, uh, no pun intended, Family Basic offered a Family Basic cart which extended the RAM, allowing you to be able to write the programs as well as run the Family Basic program. In addition to that, it came with a keyboard. On that keyboard, there were a few additional little deals there, a read and a write plug. We'll get into that a little bit later. But with this system and with the manual, you could write games in BASIC. And Nintendo taught you how to do so. It's got a little clicky keyboard to it. It's got everything you could ever need to be able to write yourself games in BASIC. So. Family Basic kind of got people uh, on the bedroom coder side of things here in uh, Japan, trying to pick up that piece and appeal to that level of audience. So, got games knocked over here. And yeah, but the question is, is if you wrote a program, well, you had enough RAM to run the program, you had to kind of ask yourself, well, how in the world am I going to store that program? Well, I told you the rabbit hole goes deep. So how deep does the rabbit hole go, you say? Well, it goes pretty deep. Because in order to store these programs, like we had mentioned before, on the back we have these little plugs. So where do those plugs go to? Because they don't go into the Famicom. That's right, folks, they go into the Famicom Data Recorder. Famicom Data Recorder, for those of you who are unaware, is a tape player by Nintendo. <laughs> it actually does play tapes. Um, it, it also uses the um, cassette media to store whatever games that you will have created in your family computer. Uh, now there were ways to get around having the family basic, so uh, if you just happen to have a copy of a game that you were trying to do a level editor on, you could go ahead and get something like this. This guy here, uh, the box is quite worse for wear, but it's old, just like everything else here. It even has its orange headphones in it. And this is by Hori. Let's take and move all that stuff out. This essentially goes into the Famicom expansion slot and it has a spot for you to put on headphones. If you wanted to try the very, very old headphones, I'm not going to try the very, very old headphones. 
However, it did have a line in and line out for you to be able to connect in, as well as making sure you didn't lose your expansion slot on your Famicom. So you'd write your games to your disc, or your, seat, your cassette in this case, and write your saves to your, your cassette, and then you would fire up your cassette every time you wanted to do your level select, and voila, whatever you created would pop back up on the screen and would be totally yours. So with all of this stuff that's in front of you, it just begs you to ask the question, well, I think I answered why we called it the family computer, why it was called the family computer. It's undeniable that uh, just by looking at this alone, if I took the games out of it and took the name cover off of it and just showed you what it was, you would say, this is an 8-bit microcomputer. But it's not. So it's led me down on a journey to go take a look at other 8-bit items. So, in the essence of time, I'm not going to show anything that's actually here uh, working because I want to keep the video short, but I have other videos coming. But if you guys want to know anything about what we have here, or you want to start your own journey down learning about ancient Japanese technology, specifically related to Nintendo, uh, leave a comment in the comment section below. Uh, if you guys do videos or you want to, uh, me to check out a video that you've currently got, go ahead and drop that down there too. I love checking out your videos and I love being part of this community. Again, anything you see here you want to know more information about, I'm more than willing to help. You guys have a great day, and bye for now.